Good morning. Good morning and welcome. This is Mr. B's Sunday School. I am Mr. B, and today we are here to consider a concept that may be completely foreign to us. Many people know or have a pretty good idea of what it means to be adopted in the 21st century. But what did it mean to be adopted in the days shortly after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead? What did Paul the Apostle think about, or what did he mean when he said that we are adopted? We'll find out in just a minute, but the first thing we like to do in this class is pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you and call you Father. Bless now the reading of your holy word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a quote for you today. Actually, we have a, a couple of quotes for you today. The first quote comes from James Packer, also known as J.I. Packer. Theologian, author, and an editor of the English Standard Version of the Bible. And he says, our first point about adoption, adoption is that it is the highest privilege that the gospel offers, higher even than justification. Of course, our justification is the foundation for our adoption, but justification isn't an end in itself. Second quote is from Wayne Grudem, professor and theologian, and he says, God could have forgiven our sins and given us right legal standing before him without making us his children. It is important to realize this because it helps us to recognize how great are our privileges in adoption. Our first reading today is from the New Living Translation Study Bible. And we're reading from the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey, obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it, is, way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, now, you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, 
God has made you his heir. Got a little sidebar note here for you. It says, in Galatians chapter 4, Paul explains how when we come to Jesus, God adopts us into his family. Adoption was seen as an immense privilege in the Roman world. The most famous Roman adoptee was Octavian, who was adopted by Julius Caesar, and who eventually became Caesar Augustus. Adoption takes someone who was not born naturally into a family and legally, legally gives them that status. That is what God has done with us. The Bible says we weren't born into his family, but he gave us the legal rights to become part of it. Through faith in Jesus and the inner working of God's Spirit, we have been adopted into his family and have become members of God's family. Paul contrasts our adoption as children with what we used to be before, slaves. But now, as children, we experience freedom we have the right to call God Abba Father. The Aramaic word little children used with their father, we have an inheritance from God. However, we should never forget that with privilege comes responsibility. The responsibility of not just receiving our Father's blessings, but also of obeying him. Okay. Now we get a definition for you. Are you ready? Definition today comes from Nelson. <laughs> new International Bible, New Illustrated. There we go. Nelson's New Illustrated Bible Dictionary. And the word of the day is adoption. Nelson says, adoption is the act of taking voluntarily a child of other parents as one's own child. In a theological sense, the act of God's grace by which sinful people are brought into his redeemed family. In the New Testament, the Greek word translated adoption literally means placing as a son. It is a legal term that expresses the process, process by which a man brings another person into his family, endowing him with the status and privileges of a biological son or daughter. In the eyes of the law, the adopted one become, became a new creature. He was regarded as being born again into the new family. An illustration of what happens to the believer at conversion. The Apostle Paul used this legal concept of adoption as an analogy to show the, the believer's relationship to God. Although similar ideas are found throughout the New Testament, the word adoption, used in a theological sense, is found only in the writings of Paul. Okay. Wikipedia says that adoption in ancient Rome was practiced and performed by the upper classes and that a large number of adoptions were performed by the senatorial class. Romans could elect to adopt relatives or complete strangers. However, in the book of Romans, Paul states that the believers who were enslaved to another master, namely sin, 
were given in adoption by God. This adoption in Romans 8 should be understood as adopting complete strangers. Our reading for you today from the English Standard Version is Romans 8, 12 through 16. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Got a little note here that says, Christians are no longer slaves to sin, but are adopted as sons into God's family as evidenced by the Spirit that cries out within them that God is their Father. Okay. Got a reading for you from the Amplified Study Bible. We're in the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 1, and we're reading verse 12 here. It says, But to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is, to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. Our little note says, this phrase, he gave the right, refers to the legit legitimate entitlement to the position of children of God. By believing, undeserving sinners can become full members of God's family. All right. Next reading is from the New International Study Bible. We're looking at Romans 8, starting at verse 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ, if indeed we share in this suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, 
the redemption of our bodies. Our little note here says, Paul uses adoption or sonship to illustrate the believer's new relationship with God. In Roman culture, the adopted person lost all rights in his old family and gained all the rights of a legitimate child in his new family. He became a full heir to his new father's estate. Likewise, when a person becomes a Christian, he or she gains all the privileges and responsibilities of a child in God's family. One of these outstanding privileges is being led by the Spirit. We may not always feel as though we belong to God, but the Holy Spirit is our witness. His inward presence reminds us of who we are and encourages us with God's love. Okay. Now, Charles Welch on the understandingbible.com informs us that in Rome, when a person was adopted, they received not only a change of name, but a change of home, as well as new privileges and new responsibilities. The adoption ceremony required witnesses. One of the seven witnesses was called when a will was read. A witness might say, I was present, and I heard the words of the vindication, and I say, this person was claimed by the deceased, not as a slave, but as a son. Got a reading for you from the New Living Translation. We're at Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 24. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers, in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who loved God, who love God, and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. <clears throat> Got a little uh, sidebar note here. It says, chosen by God. The doctrine of God's election of those saved, often called predestination, is often controversial among Christians. There is no doubt that it is taught throughout the Bible. For example, the Old Testament often calls Israel, my chosen people. While the New Testament speaks of God choosing his children, even before the world began. 
People are often spoken of as being chosen. And Jesus told his disciples, you didn't choose me. I chose you. The doctrine should lead to neither pride, like God chose me and not you, or, nor inaction. God chooses people, so why bother evangelizing? No one believed in election more than Paul, yet no one was more active in evangelizing than him. This doctrine is meant to lead to humble praise, encouragement, holy living, worship, and to preaching the gospel. And like many controversial doctrines, it has two sides. For example, we read that all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. God did the choosing, but they had to do the believing. How these fit together is one of God's mysteries, and the wise stay humble about it. Okay. Then we get a reading from the Amplified Study Bible. We're at Romans chapter 8. starting at verse 31. What then shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who can be successful against us? He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, Graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against God's elect, his chosen ones? It is God who justifies us, declaring us blameless and putting us in a right relationship with himself. Who is the one who condemns us? Christ Jesus is the one who died to pay our penalty. And more than that, who was raised from the dead and who is at the right hand of God interceding with the Father for us. Who shall ever separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, just as it, is, as it is written and forever remains written. For your sake, we are put to death all day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors and gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us so much that he died for us. For I am, in, I am convinced and continue to be convinced beyond any doubt that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the unlimited love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our little note here says, Christ created all things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible. And he was before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
if God, who was from the beginning, is, in, is for us, no created thing can separate us from his love. Our security in him is absolute. All right. A little bit of a class roundup for you. In ancient Roman times, so, uh, so far as the ceremony was concerned, the difference between the transferring of a son into slavery and his becoming a member of the family was very slight. As we remember from our earlier studies, up to 40% of the population in the Roman Empire was, at the time of the writing of the New Testament, slaves or in slavery. Bearing this in mind, we can imagine the thrill which the Roman church would experience when they heard the reading of the letter we now call the Book of Romans. Let's take another look at that, this time from the um, induct New Inductive Study Bible, New, New American Standard Bible. And that is at Romans 8, 15 through 17, and it says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption, as sons by which we cry out, Abba, or Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Okay. Our final reading today is from the book of Ephesians. And we're at Ephesians chapter 1. This is from the New Living Translation. There we go. Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ, even before he made the world. God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bring, bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what we, he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, 
we have received an inheritance from God for he for he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth the good news that God saves you and when you believed in Christ he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people he did this so we would praise and glorify him little sidebar note here says that Paul says that because we are united with Christ we have every spiritual blessing this is so important to note because many Christians today go blessing hunting thinking that this experience or that meeting will provide what they feel is lacking but Paul says that we already have everything we need to lead lives that please God Paul lists some of these blessings in verses 3 through 14 which we just read as one long set sentence in the Greek reflecting how excited Paul got by this these blessings include election God chose us even before he made the world sanctification God's destiny is for us to be holy adoption God brings us into his family redemption God purchased our freedom forgiveness God forgives and frees us through Christ's death kindness God's kind love has been showered upon us revelation God has revealed his plan to us inheritance as God's children we receive his family blessings and indwelling God gives us his spirit as his guarantee of our salvation if this does not cause us like Paul to get carried away in praise to God we haven't yet begun to understand and experience what God has done for us okay thanks be to our Heavenly Father and to our Lord Jesus Christ thanks be also to the witness of the Holy Spirit of God who is with us amen let's pray Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. I pray that you will bless the reading of your word for each of us this week. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Have a great week.